Hello, this is Robert Rickover. I'm an Alexander Technique teacher in Omaha, Nebraska. And as you can see, it's late in the day and the sun is low. So there's some unexpected light coming through here. My guest is Amanda Cole, who is... Um, well, I'll, I'll read the blurb. She's written a book called Marjorie Barstow and the Alexander Technique, Critical Thinking in Performing Arts Pedagogy. And, and I really, want to, can I just chime in here? I really wanted to call it critical and creative thinking in performing arts pedagogy, but the publishers wouldn't let me. Uh -huh. And so I had to choose between critical and creative, which I really didn't want to do, but... <laughs> and, yeah, well, Amanda is, is a, apart from being a very serious student of the Alexander Technique, in, including the sort of classical versions um, and the Marge Barstow version, which is quite different. She is also a, uh, <clears throat> I'll just read a little from the back of the book here. She's a performer, a researcher and writer, a music educator. And also, uh, you mentioned you have a degree in teaching or yeah, what? Masters of teaching. Masters in teaching. She's a research fellow at Griffith University in Brisbane. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, very good. Australia. <laughs> She's won numerous awards for, for creative projects, research projects, and professional uh, development. And she has a doctorate in performing arts pedagogy from Griffith University and a master's of music performance from the University of Melbourne. And among these um, uh, research projects, she has uh, had access to letters between FM Alexander, Frank Pierce Jones, Marjorie Barstow, and John Dewey. And they were all kind of corresponding with each other. FM was sort of the centerpiece of that um, collection of people. And there were other important people like A.R. Alexander that, that fit into this too. But um, we've had a discussion about the general what her her findings from these letters, which are quoted quite extensively in the book, and they're compellingly fascinating for anyone, anyone who's interested in the Alexander technique, they're compellingly fascinating for just an ordinary person, they would make no sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to say, it's amazing to me that you got it published. I mean, oh, it, really? You know, it's it's definitely a niche in the greater world of ideas. Yes. So I would like to, we've had a, a fairly general conversation about these, what, what, what uh, Amanda has learned from these letters. But I want to read a couple of quotes from Alexander. The first one is from his first book, in which he says, and I think a lot of Alexander teachers have problem with this, but I'll just read it as he wrote it. Uh, so this is like probably 1911, maybe, or maybe 1918. I'm not sure which edition of MSI this was in, or first was in. And he says, I wish to do away with such teachers as I am myself. My, pla my place in the present economy is due to a misunderstanding of the causes of our present physical disability. And when this disability is finally eliminated, the specialized practitioner will have no place, no uses. This may be a dream of the future, but in its beginnings, it is now capable of realization. That's a really interesting quote. You can imagine how some teachers don't really want to make too much of that. Yeah, basically saying away with themselves to be eliminated someday. Yes, <laughs> and then from his last book, Universal Constant and Living, after working for a lifetime in this new field, I am conscious that the knowledge gained is but a beginning. My experience that and that my experience may one day be recognized as a signpost directing the explorer to a country 
hitherto undiscovered and one which offers unlimited opportunity for fruitful research to the patient and observant pioneer. Which I love that. Um, yeah, that's much. I love them both, but I especially love that. But in reading the, this correspondence the, the, between these four characters, FM, Frank Pierce Jones, Dewey, and Marge, it doesn't seem like he was actually really dedicated to that, especially the second one. There seems, mm. it seems, Marge says this, Frank Pierce Jones says this, I don't know that Dewey said it, I'm not sure Dewey was involved directly with that, but they both felt that he was not really, um, he wasn't all that interested in ideas that didn't come from him. Maybe is that is that an accurate way to put yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. And I would say when you were asking about not sure about whether Dewey said it, Dewey definitely had the same experience. Dewey worked really hard to get uh, independent uh, scientific experiments right. yes, on the standard technique. And every time it got close, uh, Alexander would go on and and, I, they, and look, I, I, to, to be fair to Alexander, I <laughs> I faced some of the same difficulties when I was coming up with my research question and how to collect data around the Alexander technique. It's incredibly fraught with difficulty because of the way, uh, you know, he, Alexander's problem was that he said that the doctors weren't trained, the doctors who would necessarily be doing this research weren't trained in seeing the whole person. And so they might do some experiments and then they wouldn't actually be trained like he thought he was and probably was right. uh, to see, they weren't trained to be able to see the differences that he wanted them to be able to see. And so I understand his reservations, but um, Dewey's experience was that Dewey, you know, worked really hard on, um, on advocating the Alexander technique and getting funds and um, huge amounts of, of funding for research. And then Alexander just walked away from it and said, no. And so it seemed a bit like what you're saying. That we should add, Dewey did write the introduction to three of Alexander's yeah. books and they were very yeah. uh, approving introductions. Yes. Very well written. Yes says some things using words that it's too bad Alexander himself didn't pick up on, but, you know, very, very yeah. positive uh, about it. And he, and apparently even in his old age, uh, he was still saying, you know, I got so much. Yeah, I got a lot from Alexander. It. So I don't think it's about any of these people um, tearing up, you know, downgrading the others, but it does seem like Alexander was not didn't really want to share this in a in no. a way that you might think would be nice. Like he was he was like 81 years old when Marge suggested, hey, maybe you know Frank Pierce Jones would be a good guy to have sort of as your representative in the States. Mm -hmm. He wasn't having any of that. Um yeah. and, um, wait, and I mean sure people know this as well that um Wilfred Barlow and Marjorie Barlow, um, like Marjorie actually, there was a, there was a, um, a, a rupture, a rupture, <laughs> so I'm thinking French, a rift um, in Marjorie oh, yeah, Barlow. Absolutely, with between over, uh, over the, of the society. famous, famous door slamming, boy, I can't find a good spot here, can I? <laughs> a famous door slamming incident, yeah, well, so there were, there was a rebellion in the ranks, even within the more classical uh, way of yeah, yeah. for sure and again, um, just not wanting to hand over any yeah so anything yeah and well and perhaps and wanting it to die he, despite what he wrote perhaps actually wanting it to die with him well Who i knows? think maybe a, ch a more charitable thing would be these these two quotes of his are references to after he dies then 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 okay people yeah can, yeah and and yeah, I think, I think yeah, yeah. to be charitable to FM, I, I don't. I assume you've read uh, Block Block's book on yeah. biography. One of the things you learn in that book 
which is really important to understand about Alexander, is he was constantly, constantly being called on to support members of his family and to keep them afloat because he, I think it was a somewhat dysfunctional family that he was born into. And he was, he was, right. he was putting, sending money back to Australia all the time for these people. And it was constant demands. So there was sort of an economic force there that maybe, maybe made him reluctant to sort of cede control or cede, cede much to other people you know he yeah wanted out of it, it being conservative of of his livelihood and the family in his family's livelihood yeah yeah so, um do, do you have anything more you'd like to say about this um reluctance to to sanction other variants or new developments in his work well again to be fair to him i think there were um he did have well there, there were some charlatans and as there always will be in oh there were oh, in society oh, and yes. he'd had a terrible experience with the the media school um and called them i mean the the the, the people there were were had not been trained themselves and were taking it up or had had a few lessons I think and were taking it upon themselves to train teachers and so he called those people vandals and I think then because they were in America he just decided that everything American was bad yeah one of his other easy to do because you're such a big country and yeah and, and the the kind of knee-jerk reaction for for us who are, are not in America is just to go it's all it's the whole thing you know yeah yeah <laughs> Um, and I think that's what he did after that happened. And so because Marge, also Marge had sent him a letter in the 1940s, which Walter Carrington quoted in his diary saying that, um, that Marge had gone completely off the rails. And I think I don't, I don't have that letter and I haven't seen it. So we, we may never know what that said, although I believe, um, that someone has those letters. I, mm, it's interesting. Story, which yeah. I won't go into, but I, I have a feeling someone has that letter still, and I would love to see it. But um, it's the letter where Marge just told him, I think it was 1946, and Marge wrote to FM telling him some of the things she'd been playing with, basically. Right. And he completely went off the deep end and obviously told everyone and then what it ended up in Walter Carrington's diary. So it was obviously, you know, the flavor of the moment to talk about right. mad right. and what she'd been doing. And I think then the, the media school stuff went completely overboard. And that was about the time when Frank was training. And so I think even though FM, you know, FM knew that, that Frank Pierce Jones was a reasonable guy and he had years of knowing that Marge was a reasonable person as well I, I mean I can't believe that his overall impression of Marge from the lifetime of knowing her was that she was you know mad or a charlatan right. um because he did write back to her not in response to that she she did write a couple of letters which she said he never answered but that wasn't the end of their correspondence altogether she mm -hmm. did hear from him again so yeah he, he wasn't i i'm just all i'm saying is that i think he he had reason to be conservative around what he'd created and to to worry about what people were doing with it um and maybe you know i don't know he was getting old then and maybe it was just harder for him to um to satisfy himself that it was a safe thing to do to to let someone else take over in a in a large country yeah but of course the sad thing was that the, that he wasn't going to take it over for sure no um, no so it's too bad because i think frank and marge and i suppose there are other teachers could have really um would benefit it with a bit of an endorsement from from alexander which they yes 
didn't didn't get. Yeah, and 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 you know, you mentioned he'd had bad experiences with with Americans, and one of those was this guy. I forget his first name. It, it was some, Lee, I think, was his last name. Yeah, uh, he wrote books about. Yes, he said how wonderful Alexander. He started by saying, you know, I think he was in New England, maybe a professor i don't know what he he was in new england somewhere and he he just said oh this is the greatest thing uh ever and you know it's so important that it should be a requirement for people who are in congress to get alexanderized before they start making any decisions you know whatever that means but then <laughs> then he went he went off in a yeah. quite a dramatically different direction and Alexander was rightly incensed by it. I mean, he yeah. went off in a really weird way, whereas someone like Marge didn't just jump off in weird ways. She was constantly wow. building, experimenting. Yeah. All through the time I knew her, she was constantly trying to refine how she was teaching. You know, yeah. at the end of a of the of a workshop. I, I sometimes I would drive her back or I would just talk to her a bit before she went home. And she'd say, she'd say, Bob, because that was my name. Then, Bob, I think I got something done a little better this time than before, you know, not as sort of self-congratulatory, but she was trying to be more effective, effective teacher. Yeah. Was yeah. always looking for that. Mm -hmm. Some of the videos that you may have seen, there's one on YouTube where she shows up, says, you know, I've been thinking all night about what happened yesterday, the question that came up, you know, and, you know, she, she really, she didn't have a fixed plan. She was constantly, oh, let's try this and see if it works. And some of the things she tried didn't really work that well, but a lot of them did. And I mean, by the time I arrived at her doorstep she had already tried out quite a few and i have no right. idea what, what they were but yeah is there anything so is there anything else you want to say about that whole topic of fm and and his sort of keeping it wanting to keep the work centered on him and how it affects things today maybe uh the only, like going back to the MSI quote that yeah. you read out uh -huh. um, and mentioning that he wanted to do away with teachers such as himself. Yeah, um, I think he was thinking maybe sometime after his death. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe, I think maybe it's, it was, maybe that's a little harsh. I think maybe he was pretty idealistic at that point. Yeah. And often, I mean, I, I wonder if there was an Alexander who wrote the books and then an Alexander who actually functioned in the world, like whether mm -hmm. he really believed this when he wrote it, but when he was actually faced with people saying, I want to do this to your work, um, he suddenly closed down and realised that it was it was idealistic. Um, maybe, And then he went the other way in real life, you know, that there was... There was a, a him that he wanted to be, wanted to aspire to be this person who, who was idealistic, I suppose, and who was um, humble enough to, to say, I've, in, I've found this thing, but it's just the beginning. Yeah. But then, yeah, but then when it came down to it, it was not. Yeah, yeah. What he had expected. Well, people weren't taking it in ways into directions that he had but d thought you know until someone actually takes it into a new direction it's very easy to say oh it'd be great if people take this into new directions and then when you see the actual directions you go oh actually uh, maybe not <laughs> so. yeah well it's it's so interesting when i look back on my first experience working with marge for the first few years really I'd be looking around at this whole scene where there's zillions of people in a room and this little tiny lady in the middle and I would be thinking, this is very different from how Alexander taught, for sure. But I had the feeling that if he were kind of looking at it, he, he and with an open mind, he would say, yeah. wow, 
That's yeah. very good. You know, she has figured out a way of helping people to really start thinking for themselves in a way that I never, never occurred to me to try. Yeah. I think he would have been, you know, the the him in this imaginary scenario would have been very supportive of it. He would yeah. not have thought. See, he certainly wouldn't have said, well, she's gone off the rails. I think if she's if he saw her in action. I think that that's my yeah I guess and what a shame that he was um not able to even if he'd been physically able to get over to to see her teaching yeah um whether he had been whether whether he would have been mentally open enough in maybe in not who knows 80s and 90s well it was a, yeah it was quite a scene there it wouldn't wouldn't mm wasn't a typical British uh, sort of teaching situation at all. Um, so uh, let's, unless you want to add some more, let's end this conversation. And then if we have time, I've got a kind of a follow-up on, okay. on what we just did. Is that okay? Okay. So uh, my guest has been Amanda Cole, and we will be doing another podcast. Thank you.